Welcome everyone. My name is Susan Convier and I am a tribal coordinator for EPA Region 10's um, tribal program. And we're really delighted to have you with us and to be able to put on this webinar today, which uh, has taken a lot of time um, and professionalism to organize and we really appreciate that. Um, today's topic is uh, tribal climate change adaptation and preparedness. And we are being hosted very kindly by the Alaska Forum on the Environment. Um, today's technical se session is one of nearly 100 technical sessions that the forum has offered in 2021. Uh, these sessions are made uh, possible through a partnership with the Connect Tribe and their development of the Alaska Connect training platform. Um, although this session is hosted by the Alaska Forum, it is perfectly appropriate for tribes not only in Alaska, but also Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. So we hope we have representation from the entire region. Uh, as I said, I'm a tribal coordinator. I work with tribes in Alaska uh, and uh, help them to manage their gap grants. Um, and I have a, a, a wide array of great speakers with us today. Let me just say a little bit more about the forum. It strives to provide a diversity of perspectives and in all information we present, that they present. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, and it does not take political or advocacy positions. So um, this uh, webinar, as I said, is for Northwest and Alaskan tribes who are seeking to address climate change adaptation and preparedness. Our speakers come from EPA and Alaska and the lower 48, and they will discuss tribal climate change uh, adaptation plans and climate resources, as well as best practices and lessons learned. This webinar is part of EPA's effort to directly respond to the priorities that tribes have described in their EPA Tribal Environmental Plans, the ETEPs. And I uh, many thanks to Lauren McDade, who is an EPA Pathways student intern in Region 10 uh, in, in the Water Division, and her boss, Catherine Gokul, for putting this webinar together. Um, we encourage you to post your comments in the chat box and we will stop, uh, there'll be three separate sections. We'll stop after each section for question and answer. And with that, let me turn it over to Lauren. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today. My name is Lauren McDade and I am an intern working in the EPA Region 10 Water Division in close coordination with the EPA Water Division Tribal Specialists. This webinar was coordinated in an effort to respond to the needs and priorities that have been raised to EPA by Region 10 tribes in the EPA Tribal Environmental Plans, or ETEPs. Although issues may differ in the state or community that you live in, we're all facing issues arising from climate change, and we're all trying to figure out how to deal with it. This forum provides an opportunity for tribes to hear directly from EPA about tools and resources to address climate change and for Region 10 tribes to hear from each other about best practices and lessons learned related to climate change. We also wanna give you a chance to ask questions and express your thoughts about the needs in your communities. Our agenda is pretty full today, so we'll be on a tight time frame, but I encourage you to use the chat feature for questions and comments. With that, if there are any questions that don't get answered, please feel free to reach out to us after the webinar. And then I'm gonna briefly go over the agenda. So we're first gonna have Vicki Salazar and Stephanie Santel. And then we'll hear from Matt Martinson and then Britta Beerwagon, all EPA employees. And then we'll have a break for questions and discussions. And then we'll hear from Courtney Greiner and Zoe Roberts, and then have another quick break for questions and discussion. And then we'll hear from Jennifer Robinette, Hal Shepard, and Stephen Payton. And then one last chance for questions and comments. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vicki. Great, thank you so much. And it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just, um, so my name is Vicki Salazar. Um, as some of you may know, I have spent a long time in Region 10, have been part of the Region 10 community for many, many years. Um, and then 
about six or eight months ago, I have moved back to our DC office to help support climate adaptation work um, at the national level. And so my job here, what I'm going to be doing today is just kind of running you through some of what's happening at the national level, some of the information we used to um, help develop what's happening at the national level, and then um, honestly asking you to help provide some input back to us about what are the climate adaptation um, priorities for your tribe. So next slide. So before I get in you know, to the EPA specific things, I just think it's really important to note that uh, tackling the climate crisis really is a whole of government approach. Every agency in the country is um, looking at, you know, how do we support communities, including and sometimes especially tribal communities, as they are dealing with uh, the devastating impacts of climate change. This is in addition to what we're trying to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so this is not something that just EPA is doing alone. We're working with many of the partners that you work with as uh, tribes, um, as we're thinking about how do we connect the dots and, and really support tribal governments um, to address climate adaptation needs. Um, we are talking at the national level. I'm trying to kind of reduce that coordination burden on you. Um, but as you probably have already seen somewhat, um, we're in the beginning stages of that. And so, you know, please appreciate your uh, kind of flexibility and grace with us as we are figuring it out, because um, really the goal across all of the agencies is to support you more effectively. Um, so in addition to kind of this whole of government approach, um, you know, when President Biden issued Executive Order 14008, and that's the executive order where all of this work is flowing from, they actually required us to do two additional things as an agency. One is to issue a policy statement on climate change adaptation, and the second is to issue a climate adaptation action plan. EPAs is available on our website under, um, if you just... Uh, kind of Google Climate Adaptation EPA, it'll pop right up. And in there, you should see kind of a lot of things related to tribes and our uh, tribal trust responsibility. I'm going to go into some of it here today, but I just know I won't get to all of it in my like 10 minutes. <laughs> um, the last thing I just want to note is that one of the major things that's coming through this executive order is this kind of focus on uh, serving communities with environmental justice concerns and, and really knowing that not everybody is impacted the same. And, and for those communities and individuals who are impacted more directly, we need to have a more direct and supportive role. Next slide. Okay, next slide. This is the plan I talked about. Next slide again, Lauren. Um, so EPA um, did issue a policy statement, and um, they were very, very clear about what was expected of all of EPA's programs, partnerships, um, kind of interactions. Um, the first one was to, we needed to integrate climate adaptation planning and strategies into all of our EPA programs, policies, and rulemaking processes. So every way that we do work at EPA, we should be paying attention to climate adaptation and those impacts. The second directive um, that we heard um, through our policy statement, and this came straight down from Administrator Regan, is that we really needed to work and consult with and partner with uh, states, tribes, territories, local governments, environmental justice organizations, and a whole group of other organizations to ensure that we are really meeting their needs as um, they're facing kind of these impacts from climate change. Next slide. So EPA has issued that Climate Adaptation Action Plan, and I'm going to be talking about how this Climate Adaptation pl Action Plan feeds into our strategic plan. Um, so within that plan, there's really five you know, primary goals. The first two are really what I talked about earlier. Um, you know, really integrating climate adaptation into our programs, policies, rulemaking processes, enforcement activities, kind of everything we do. And then again, that really that emphasis on consulting, working with, and partnering with states, tribes, territories, environmental justice organizations, and everybody else as we're doing this work. 
In addition to that, they've really identified that we need to, you know, kind of protect our workforce and our facilities so that we can t continue to provide services. I think all of us experienced a couple of years ago when COVID um, hit that these, um, you know, when there's changes um, in the world around us, it impacts our ability to meet our mission and to do the things that we're trying to do from an environmental perspective. Um, you're going to see huge increases in the level at which we're kind of measuring and evaluating our assistance on climate adaptation. And then, and I think this is, you know, particularly important for tribes, is really to identify and address climate adaptation science needs. I know that in my time in Region 10, um, often, particularly in Alaska, but in many of, on many, many tribal lands, we've been faced with the issue of not having enough information to have good decision making and really not having the kind of breadth or depth of information that's needed. And so these are some of the things that we're hoping to hear through the climate adaptation kind of work that'll be coming over the next couple, next four years for sure. Next slide. So I want to just kind of note that we keep, this is a climate adaptation action plan, and we know that there's lots of co-benefits to climate adaptation, including greenhouse gas reductions, um, but also other things like livability, subsistence foods and resources, um, you know, protecting of subsistence foods and resources, you know, um, economic development, and many, many other things. And so while this plan is really around climate adaptation, it's also designed to capture some of those co-benefits um, that we're hoping to capture. Next slide. So as uh, Susan mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of the emphasis, um, you know, we do review the ETEPs in Region 10. And um, in the review of those ETEPs, um, several tribal identify, uh, priorities have been really identified. You know, these are, you know, what we found is that just about every single um, tribe or tribal nation in Region 10 identified climate change in some way as a priority. Um, they didn't always call it climate change, but this was really identified as something that this is very important and, and, they, and that they thought we must, you know, we must address it. They also identified some kind of sub uh, context or some subtopics within there that I just wanted to highlight. Um, and, and that is, you know, things like subsistence resources and food and impacts on water, you know, the need for resilience, planning and preparedness, um, flooding and shoreline erosion, um, ambient air quality. Um, it's not written on this list for some reason, but indoor air quality also came up as a big issue. Um, displacement, public health, infrastructure. These are all things that have been identified by all of you as kind of priorities. And I'm going to just pop in the chat here really quick, um, just kind of a question and would love to hear you respond um, to hear you say, like, is this still the same? Are these the same issues for you today? Is this what you're like focusing on right now? Um, and then I also want to say that while these are being identified, and this was kind of 2014 to 2020, um, kind of what we had at that point, not only are we seeing kind of more issues identified, but we're also seeing the frequency of issues, um, you know, kind of being identified. So back in, uh, you know, 2014, um, each tribal ETEP that we read kind of identified about three issues. Um, in 2020, there were identifying about seven issues. So there's a lot of, you know, kind of increase in the impacts. And as we all know, these things are happening kind of faster and um, in more extreme ways and tribes are on the front line of these impacts. Next slide. When we're thinking about how to address climate change, um, and this is, should be very familiar to you, what we're seeing is that, well, climate change, the diverse, you know, the local impacts are really, really diverse. And so what we're feeling even within Region 10 might be very different depending on kind of where you're sitting in Region 10. And this is, you know, I acknowledge a national map, but I think that across Region 10, we're experiencing all of these impacts. You know, we experience wildfire and permafrost melt and drought and flooding and, you know, changes in seasonality and food systems, um, you know, extreme, you know, intense storms. So all of these things that we're seeing right across the country, we get, you know, we're experiencing them firsthand and we're having to address them firsthand in Region 10. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna move on a little bit to what's in our strategic plan. 
Um, and again, and within our strategic plan, which is um, just closed in terms of public comment, but there's kind of an ongoing set of discussions that we'll be having with tribes in particular um, around these discussions. So the first one, um, the first goal in our strategic plan around climate change is really around reducing emissions that cause uh, climate change. The second goal um, and the topic of today's session, and I'll go into more detail on that, is accelerating resilience and adaptation to climate change impacts. And then the third goal is advancing international and subnational climate efforts. Um, a lot of the work that we're going to be doing with U.S. tribes will fall under this objective 1.2. Next slide. Lauren, next slide. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so. When um, we dig a little bit into objective 1.2, you know, really with the data that you've all provided us through the ETEFs and through ongoing kind of engagement, not just in region 10, but right across the country and listening to tribes, you know, we've identified, you know, three long-term performance goals. The first one is around like uh, developing implementation plans for ourselves. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard OIDA, um, Office of International and Tribal Affairs, um, the Tribal Office will be holding a listening session on their action plan and implementation plan coming up on December 9th. The second one is, a, and so every program in the nation is doing that, um, every region in the, in the country is doing it, but um, there's a specific listening uh, session on uh, December 9th. The second one is really um, kind of increasing the level at which EPA is assisting federally recognized tribes to take action to anticipate, prepare for, adapt to, or recover from the impacts of climate change. And we've defined that assistance um, as kind of you know, providing money, providing technical assistance, and providing training. Um, but one of the things we want to hear from all of you is, how do you want that assistance? You know, um, we, we recognize that, you know, the assistance that we provide really needs to be meaningful and useful to you as tribal governments. And so we want, you know, as we're kind of going through this process of developing our plans and, you know, really developing the kind of nuts and bolts of this measure, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that supports tribes. Um, and then the third one is really kind of a specific measure for assisting kind of everyone else um, out there. But because of the importance of tribes, both to EPA's mission and the impacts that you're feeling from climate change, um, tribes were called out as their own kind of specific goal within the EPA strategic plan. Next slide. Vicki, just to note that we're coming towards the uh, 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so I think my last, uh, slide. Um, I've, yeah, or maybe one more. Um, so the only, what I want to leave with is really just, there are multiple ways to engage with us and provide us your input. One, if you drop things um, in the chat, tell us what are your top priorities, your top three priorities. Um, if they're all on the list, you can kind of highlight them again. We, we do read your input. Um, there's also the, you know, EPA climate adaptation plans, and um, there's ongoing engagement around that plan, and we'll be updating our plan um, annually. The 22 to 26 strategic plan, um, the comments closed on uh, December, on uh, November 12th, but all of us who are kind of working with tribes really have an open door for listening to you and wanting to hear your thoughts around the plan. And then the last way is that each, as I said, each region and program is developing an implementation plan, and um, we encourage you to engage in the implementation plan that's being developed in Region 10, and there will be specific listening sessions for tribes as that moves forward. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Stephanie, who's in the Office of Water, and um, let her tell you a little bit some about the tools and resources that we have. Stephanie? Yes, thank you, Vicki, and thank you all for having me today. I'm really excited to be here, and you are the one of the first groups of folks that I'm connecting with um, about this resource that we've developed, which is really exciting. So I will start off by saying, you know, the National Water Program at EPA is no stranger to working on climate change. We have had a strategy in place since 2008, and a lot of activities have gone on. Um, and our now assistant administrator for water often says that climate stress is experienced as water stress. Um, what I usually say uh, very much in line with that is that 
water is the environmental medium through which climate change really does kind of manifest in our everyday lives. So we can really play this critical role in delivering federal resources to our water community partners that we work with so that they can better protect themselves um, and the water resources that they depend on from the impacts of climate change. So we've done a lot um, over the past couple of years to help states, tribes, communities, and a wide variety of water sector partners with Re increasing their resilience and responding to the climate risks that they're facing, whether it's through providing technical assistance, offering stakeholder convening and outreach or education support to just increase awareness of how climate may impact a community or a program, um, offering financial and support for making those investments in climate adaptation or climate mitigation activities, and then coordinating with other federal programs so that we can create new opportunities for you all and others that we work with in terms of resource availability. And as Vicki mentioned earlier, those policy co-benefits. So you're performing a water management activity, but it's getting at a lot of other priorities that your community has, whether it's social, economic, cultural, or what have you. Um, understanding that's a really um, that's a really key um, goal for many of the folks that we work with, um, especially those with limited resources. So. Um, we actually created this catalog, as I'll call it, which is short descriptions of select national water programs that states, tribes, localities, and many others can explore for a variety of all the different types of support that I just mentioned um, as you work to make your communities and your water resources or infrastructure more resilient. So in keeping with EPA's Climate Adaptation Action Plan and our agency-wide directives, we really kept equity and access in mind here, particularly to those that may just be getting started on addressing their climate concerns. Um, and why we did it is because we heard from a lot of the, the stakeholders that we work with um, that there was a, just a need to understand this landscape of assistance that the federal national water programs can provide for actually performing climate change activities. Um, we were surprised to hear that it was really difficult for folks to navigate that. And then within a given program, it was unclear how those program operations or the assistance of that program could go towards helping to advance climate change actions on the ground. So we developed this catalog um, that it has 31 program overviews for just the water programs. Um, it is not entirely comprehensive, but it's a really strong start highlighting everything from national level programs like the 404 Clean Water Act program for wetlands, all the way down to the geographic programs that we have at EPA, like Puget Sound, Chesapeake Bay, and others that are working with communities on the ground to deliver this federal support. Um, we also have an awesome appendix that contains highlights of work happening specifically in each EPA region, so local to you, noteworthy tools and technical assistance from our Office of Research and Development, so you'll hear from Britta about some of those, and then a compilation of really helpful analytical or decision support tools from EPA. So that item is going to be released in the very, very near future. I was, I was sad that I couldn't kind of showcase it uh, as a kind of a grand uh, statement today. Um, but we will also be presenting during OIDA's listening session that Vicki mentioned earlier on December 9th, as well as connecting with the National Tribal Operations Council this Thursday to discuss OW's approach for our climate adaptation implementation plan. So there's more to come um, on that landscape, but we're particularly excited about the catalog. Um, it describes what we do in each program in just two to three pages, very high level. Um, I told my team that I worked with creating this. If your aunt, you know, at a holiday or a gathering can't understand what you do. Um, when you describe it in these two or three pages, we're not hitting the mark. So um, I think this will be a great resource for 
many of the people that we work with to get just a general understanding out there of how the water programs can help the people that we work with and really effectively assist them. So with that, I will stop there. Thank you, Vicki and Stephanie. Matt, if you're ready, you are up next. All right. Well, many of you, if you're like me, you learned early in your career that you should be pro uh, solution oriented rather than problem focused. We can all think of some version of a story where we had an early supervisor who told us to bring, up, bring them solutions, not problems, or uh, even in kind of self-help uh, arenas we hear about focusing on solutions rather than problems. What I'm here to share with you today is in the context of planning effective projects, we have to turn that thought process on its head. Um, the problem and understanding of the problem and investing in an understanding of the problem that we're seeking to solve through a project is probably the most critical in my opinion and then based on uh, body of research around the, the arena of project quality and design for quality. Um, understanding the problem is essential to an effective and successful infrastructure pro project, and I'd say any project. You're probably wondering why I'm talking to you about this in the context of climate adaptation and tribal concerns. Um, the, the short answer is, is that you know, we're talking about taking on in the infrastructure arena, arena with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the kinds of challenges that face tribal communities and uh, communities throughout Alaska, um, we're, we're talking about some really complex problems. And if this opportunity to invest infrastructure funding, an unprecedented once in a century type investment opportunity is really gonna make a difference, we have to have effective projects that deliver results. And I, I, I'm here today and I, I was asked to come talk about infrastructure in the context of climate and tribes. And I, I, with the 10 minutes that uh, we have together, I thought the most important thing I could bring is talking about projects. Um, so, you know, I, I hesitate to use much of the time to talk about who I am and what, why uh, my perspective on this is relevant, but I, I feel like I need to share a little bit. Uh, first, I'd offer, I grew up in North Dakota in a, a rural state and uh, I grew up in a family plumbing shop. And so my parents owned a business that was oriented towards solving people's problems. Uh, I went on and became a civil engineer. And uh, my first job out of college was working for the Indian Health Service as a US Public Health Service officer. The uniform that I wear here is still the US Public Health Service um, uniform. And I, I worked for Indian Health Service in that capacity for 22 years. I also uh, uh, spent some time at the Centers for Disease Control as a construction project manager. And over that, uh, before coming to EPA in 2019, I was the director of the Division of Sanitation Facilities Construction for the Pacific Northwest. And in that time, uh, the portfolio projects that we manage for tribes to bring water and sewer infrastructure to the tribes of the Northwest uh, was uh, around 300 active projects at any given time. And in my, my seven years in the role, we developed uh, about 160 new projects involving about uh, close to $50 million worth of funding for the tribes of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. So in my new role at EPA, new two and a half years ago, uh, infrastructure and drinking water and uh, NPDES permitting programs fall, fall to me. And this infrastructure law that's passed and, and the investment of those funds are, are my responsibility in Region 10 EPA. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So a little bit about the construct. Um, this looks awfully simple as you're looking at this. And I wanted it to be memorable. This is drawn from uh, kind of my composite of thinking of what I think makes for a, a, a success, successful project that delivers results. 
it's it's really simple and it's the kind of thing that that is meant to be memorable as you think through project teams and engaging with communities whether your role is a is a as a community member or if you're uh, an engineering consultant or some other kind of consultant that this can be helpful to you uh, i've seen many times where seasoned designers seasoned uh, engineers seasoned um, project managers don't follow this and their projects uh, don't end up delivering the results that the community expected. So first you have to understand the problem and I'm talking about understanding the problem not in a way where you say we need a new water treatment plant or we need a new, that's not the problem. The problem is understanding what it is that's deficient and what the community's needs are both now and in the future and other dimensions of the problem can include things like, do we really have uh, uh, the staff on hand to be able to operate the kind of plant that we want to build? Or do we need to develop that, uh, that kind of uh, team uh, within our utility? Uh, that's just one example. So as you bring together the planning for a project, you need to understand all of the dimensions of the, of the problem. The next step is to scope and plan the project to address all of those problems. And as the scoping stage moves forward, this, those are, this is where the identification of solutions are coming into the picture. They need to be checked back against, are we solving the question of, are we solving the problem or the problems? Then of course, this sounds really simple, but then you move forward into whether it's procurement uh, or implementation but you manage against these earlier stages. Uh, you can't just put them aside and put them in the rear view mirror. You have to continue to check back to make sure that you're solving the problem that you set out to solve from the outset. Again, sounds really simple, but when you get into the thick of large uh, or major infrastructure projects, these things get lost in the mix because there are so many details that go into the plans and specifications and the bidding process and the uh, the kinds of issues that arise during the construction phase of a project. So you can go to the next slide. The other aspect of this that I like to talk about is just enduring solutions. And what I mean by that are just things that last generations and that have the uh, intended effect for more than just the, the day after the facility or the improvement is completed. And enduring solutions have these three major traits in my mind. They integrate multiple things and they solve multiple problems. They don't look at the world as a one-dimensional problem that needs a one-dimensional solution. They invest in people. And in the case of the kinds of infrastructure that I've spent most of my uh, career thinking about water and wastewater facilities, we're thinking about the operators and the users and the community, the, the people who will have to uh, make sure that the plant is working right and that the pumps are replaced on a, a recurring cycle so that the water can flow to the tap day in, day out for 50 years. Um, a brand new water treatment plant, brand new water mains, brand new pumps, those things don't deliver the water to the tap in a way that's uh, safe and reliable. It's the uh, utility operations and the utility team that does that for the long term, working in conjunction with the regulatory community uh, in the case of Alaska communities, it's uh, ADEC. In the case of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, for uh, uh, tribal lands, it's, um, it's the EPA, but for non-tribal lands, it's the state uh, agencies. Uh, and then investing in the care and maintenance. The, you know, we all know that things that we care for and maintain for the long term continue to pay those benefits over, over decades. Can you go to the next slide. There's a lot to pack in here, and this is actually a, 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 a drawing I did on kind of an overhead uh, back in 2018 uh, for a staff discussion. Uh, it's a, it looks like a funnel, uh, but it's, it's a composite of different or a simplification of work that had been done in uh, various research around uncertainty that's associated with cost and project scope as, as a project goes from an initial idea all the way to the point where it's designed and bid out for construction. It's, it's too much to get into. We could actually have an hour long lecture around just this slide and sit here and talk about different things and anecdotes. 
of uh, experiences or illustrative examples around it. We can't do that today. I think if, the, if there's one thing you take away, it is over on the left, you're talking at the point at which a need is identified, a community is identified that something's deficient and it needs to be fixed. At that point, the, there shouldn't be a, a, a solution identified. Just to the right of that, there are options that begin to be evaluated. And when you're talking about options, uh, you don't know what the cost is gonna be because it's kind of like if you're gonna build a house, you're gonna build a house. House could be 200,000, it could be 500,000, it could be a million, uh, it, depends on, it depends on what kind of house and where you're gonna put it. And uh, you know whether you're gonna be out in the country or whether you're gonna be in a city. Similar, it's like that for every project. But as the definition of the project progresses, the certainty about what you're going to be doing to solve the problem becomes more certain. And then the uncertainty around the cost estimate uh, decreases, and that's what that narrowing of those lines are. And the middle line is the your best guess of what the project's going to cost as, as the concept develops. And your upper and lower um, possibilities of what that are um, decrease because you have a better idea of, of what it is that's going to be built. You go to the next slide. So real, uh, real quickly, the research around this from various um, journals of uh, project management and construction engineering, particular to infrastructure, uh, have found that the deviations in projects, the, the kind of things that cause projects to, to uh, go over their budget or exceed their, their, um, their schedule or have to go back to the, to the proverbial drawing board involve uh, the big three are the, are the top three changes in project requirements. And in parentheses, what I had add is too late in the process, changes in project scope, too late in the project. Uh, you know, usually these things are, are rearing their ugly head when, um, when you're in the construction phase, which is not when these things should be identified. Unforeseen or differing site conditions. What do I mean by that are, you know, unexpected groundwater, unexpected boulders, um, unexpected um, soils that uh, are, are unable, that you can't support a building or a foundation on, uh, those types of things. Um, and then the last is lack of consideration for authorities with jurisdiction. And I mentioned that in the context of tribes because in, in my years uh, working with tribes, I, I, I did see from time to time different designers or different entities come along that didn't recognize uh, the unique uh, jurisdiction in which they were working, who had their own authority and their own um, their own uh, set of uh, codes and and requirements to work in that jurisdiction. And and those are things that need to be identified early in the project scoping process so that the budget can be set appropriately and the requirements can be incorporated into the project. So tying it back to the the, the broader theme of uh, climate adaptation and the kinds of infrastructure challenges. Um, you know, as we get into this process and support the investment of infrastructure dollars, we'll be looking, you know, where we have the opportunity to be looking at projects and project development. That's the broad term for that process I uh, provided in the one, two, three. Uh, you know, we'll be looking to see, is there a solution identified that is identi fixing the problem that is driving this project that serves as the justification for the investment of, of money. And uh, that at its core is the definition of, of a quality project is a project that one, one that effectively solves the problem or then uh, fulfills the need uh, that uh, was the impetus of the project in the first place. So with that, that is my uh, quick overview and happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Britta? Thanks, Lauren. Hopefully, you guys can hear me okay? All right. So thanks, everyone. Um, and good afternoon. I am 
going to talk about some of the tools from EPA, mostly from the Office of Research and Development um, that can assist with climate change uh, adaptation and preparedness. And I'll, I'll touch on some other resources from uh, some of the um, other federal agencies as well through the US Global Change Research Program, partly because there are lots of resources and because we work very closely with that program as well. Next slide, slide please. So I just wanna acknowledge um, a whole host of colleagues who have contributed slides to this presentation since this draws on mostly their work. Next slide, please. So just as a quick orientation, I'll first talk about some general tools and information, try to um, hone in on some more Alaska specific information, separating them by you know, impacts and then adaptation tools. Um, and then delve a little bit more deeply into some of the planning frameworks uh, that can be used more specifically for um, adaptation design and, um, and then talk about some resilient strategies um, again, focusing on salmon as sort of the example um, species. Um, and then lastly, just a few other tools, uh, some of which are completely applicable for Alaska and some that unfortunately don't, but could be uh, just useful to know about in general for Region 10 and others. Next, please. So the first um, set of, of kind of tools and information is this toolkit that I wanted to highlight that um, some of our colleagues that are mostly housed in, in what was more of the um, Homeland Security Center um, have put together in this resilience tools wizard. So this is a toolkit that lets you filter um, by audience topic, uh, disaster stage and resource, resource type. Um, they put this together really to help communities um, build resilience to disasters. And so this is why it um, has this, this kind of disaster framing, looking at um, preparation, mitigation, response, and recovery. But as you can see in the screenshot, um, I've highlighted climate change as the topic and, um, and the audience uh, can be a you know, tribal audience. So these are some of the tools that then come up in that search um, that, that could be applicable and, and useful in trying to uh, think about climate change preparedness in this, in this context. And the other thing to note is that there are multiple ways of accessing some of these tools. So you'll see some tools repeated in other, other places, which is good because you know, it just depends on how you access that information. Hopefully some of that will just bring you to uh, the most relevant tools, and, and those could be found here, um, potentially in Stephanie's um, catalog and some of the other tools that I'll show as well. Next slide, please. So this next resource is from the Global Change Research Program. So this is um, a whole host of federal agencies that come together to develop the National Climate Assessment, for example, but also have put together um, the Climate Resilience Toolkit, another collection of tools and information from across the federal government. So I just wanted to highlight that for the climate assessment, there are um, state climate summaries. So one of them covers Alaska. There's a specific chapter um, on Alaska focusing on, on impacts and responses. And then in the Climate Resilience Toolkit, there are case studies and this um, climate explorer as well that I'll delve into a little bit more deeply. Next slide, please. So this is just what that climate resilience toolkit looks like, that if you go to the case studies, it'll show you the whole national map, but you can um, locate case studies that are relevant to Alaska. Um, and these ones just you know, highlight um, some of the, the case studies on, on resilience and, and adaptation, particularly in those communities. Next slide, please. And then um, there's also, in terms of the, the tools in the toolkit, you can go to the Alaska and the Arctic section. And here, 
um, you can more specifically filter some of those tools by, by topic, tool function, um, resilience steps, um, and, and again, the region. So the next slide, please, will show you what happens if, um, for example, you filter by uh, tribal nations and resilience options. And this is just you know, the, the first kind of set of, of tools and information that comes up um, from that, that toolkit. Um, and these are, again, you know, done by multiple different agencies, but are, are really trying to focus on um, how, how you can prepare and respond um, and, and increase resilience uh, in communities, particularly focused on the Arctic and Alaska. Next slide, please. So now I want to focus just a little bit more on some of the um, ORD uh, frameworks and, and tools that, that we have. So these previous ones were more of these collections of tools and, and some of them from other agencies. This now focuses much more on adaptation planning. And in this case, we have several different types of, of resources and examples that um, try to look at different parts of the, the process. And a lot of these are, are designed to work with existing natural resource plans or, or watershed planning efforts um, and really help managers and, and stakeholders examine the, the steps um, and, and options that, that already are in those plans or are being thought about to look at how you could make them more climate smart, for example, and, and improve resilience. Um, and so the examples here on the, on the right are just ways of applying these, um, this, this kind of adaptation framework and, and providing some examples, whether in corals or in the Chesapeake Bay um, program office. Next slide, please. So just to kind of take a, a step back in terms of the planning process and, and part of what um, Matt was, was talking about as well, of you know, when you start with some of these plans, you're really, um, in some cases, able to start at the beginning and able to start at the scoping step. So if you are at that point, um, there are a variety of tools available. And this is one example of the scoping tool that really is focusing on um, bringing in ecosystem services and, and thinking about the relevance of these final ecosystem goods and services for the stakeholders. And it helps to um, maybe more formally add a, a prioritization step in, in that initial phase to really look at who all of the different stakeholders are, um, what benefits people are looking for or have identified in terms of ecosystem services, and then what environmental attributes would be necessary to realize those benefits. And so this tool can really help evaluate some of those alternatives. Next slide. So then once you're in a plan, then you can use something like this adaptation design tool which really is looking at existing uh, management options and tries to uh, look at that in detail of, you know, what are some of the ways that maybe it could be made more resilient, more climate smart in this case, to, um, to, be, um, to, to work over the long term to, um, you know, maybe you are altering design uh, considerations uh, because of, you know, new flood hazards um, or sea level rise or uh, relocating some aspects of, of other, you know, management actions that you would have taken. So in this case, um, my colleague Jordan West and, and other colleagues uh, at a variety of agencies um, have worked on, um, have used this in a lot of coral reef examples throughout uh, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, uh, Florida, but they've also used it in, in wetlands and, and coastal regions, the Chesapeake Bay um, and other places. And it really is trying to um, think about adaptation design in a more robust uh, sort of framework. Next slide, please. So, and then to go into kind of more detail um, in terms of 
what you might do when you are specifically planning either in a watershed or for a specific species, you know, what are some of the concerns or some of the adaptation options there? I just wanted to give a brief example um, using salmon. So obviously salmon throughout their life stages are, are um, sensitive to water temperature. And this just shows, you know, what different kind of parts of their life stages could be um, impacted by changes in temperature. Next slide, please. And these changes in temperature um, obviously are intersecting with other threats of, as well, whether it's land use changes, you know, changes in river flow, uh, but also wildfires, so other climate changes other than just temperature. Next slide, please. And what this group um, across uh, ORD and Region 10 and, and many other collaborators have found is that you know, those cold water refuges that uh, can be found in, in streams and can be enhanced through a variety of, um, of restoration or adaptation activities are really important across these migration paths but actually having that connectivity through, throughout the watershed is also important um, in terms of the diversity of, of habitats and a seasonal diversity so that the, the fish can access some of those uh, more productive warmer waters from those cooler refugia or cooler um, headwater streams once they've, um, once they've migrated up there. Um, and so that that just thinking about the diversity of um, of habitats, not just in terms of cold water refugia from from these warming overall warming streams, but also in a seasonal way is really important um, and makes it a, a you know kind of a more complex problem in terms of um, restoration and protection activities for something like salmon. Next slide, please. Um, and so this just uh, kind of summarizes that in, in order to really um, think about stream e ecosystem resilience, it's really important to think through the whole network and the watershed. And so that kind of brings it back to that watershed planning and thinking through the adaptation options and, you know, all the way from the beginning of the, um, the scoping tools to think about those ecosystem services, goods and services that, that um, people are interested in and to you know, try to take a more holistic approach. Um, next slide, please. So then lastly, really briefly, um, these are some of the, the tools. Again, it, it's, it's more of a collection of tools, the Global Change Explorer. Um, most of these are, are not, unfortunately, Alaska specific, but I wanted to point to it in terms of just having a place where um, this is where we can kind of describe and visualize these various scenarios, whether it's on um, land use change or climate um, with, with tools that can be readily used in adaptation plans. Next slide, please. There are a couple that, um, that are um, more applicable to Alaska because they're not completely tied to just the uh, lower 48 states. The adaptation design tool we've talked about. Um, and then this metro tool is, is really um, about thinking about you know, urban areas or communities from a multi-sector point of view. Next slide, please. Great and then these last time. ones. Sorry, this is Susan. I just want to let you know we, um, you have about one more minute. Are you, do you have that? Does that give you I have time? Like 10 you? seconds more to. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, thank you. Thanks. So these, these um, tools are interesting, but not, specifically relevant to Alaska, but I just wanted to point these out on the Global Change Explorer as, um, as ones that, you know, hopefully if, um, if, they, if we have the, the resources and, um, and data that we could extend into Alaska as, and other um, territories as well, um, because they, they are designed to uh, really work within uh, the, the adaptation and planning context and with um, kind of easier tools uh, like a, a GIS type of format um, other than, um, you know, some of the other climate, for example, climate information that doesn't come in quite as user-friendly a format. 
Um, and the last slide just has my contact information. So thank you. Thank you, Britta. Um, it was really interesting. And I, I um, thank all of the speakers from EPA who uh, presented those uh, resources. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat box. And I think we are, um, we have so many tribal speakers uh, to coming. I think it might be best if we just turn to our tribal panels. And then if we have questions af after their presentations, we'll turn to those. Um, we have first um, some presentations from tribes in the lower 48. Hi, my name is Courtney Greiner. Uh, I work in the shellfish program for the fisheries department for Swinomish Indian tribal community. Um, today, uh, though, I'm speaking from Nooksack uh, traditional territory. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work my colleagues and I are doing at Swinomish to address climate change. Um, if you'd advance to the next slide, please. I'm just going to briefly introduce Swinomish and the reservation, some of the uh, ways climate change is projected to impact Swinomish. Uh, steps we are taking to protect Swinomish's shellfish resources and a couple of lessons we've learned while doing this work. Next slide. So the Swinomish are descendants of four major originating Agit Samish watersheds and surrounding coastal areas and islands. They are the people of the salmon and have depended on coastal and upland resources, including salmon, shellfish, elk, and cedar since time immemorial. The reservation, which was established in 1855 by the Treaty of Point Elliot, is located on a low-lying island near La Conner, Washington. The area has already seen the damage of rising sea levels, uh, especially when combined with uh, extreme weather events. In 2006, water levels were several feet above normal during a couple of winter storms, which resulted in flooding, shoreline alterations, and community isolation. And this got many in the community concerned, not only about future risk infrastructure and services, but also natural resources and community health and well-being. Next slide, please. So in 2007, the Swinomish Senate issued a proclamation to study the potential effects of climate change on the reservation community, lands, and resources, as well as determine appropriate actions. This resulted in the publication of two documents. The first document was an impact assessment technical report published in 2009. The tribe partnered with the University of Washington's Climate Impacts Group to conduct an impact and vulnerability assessment as well as a risk analysis. As specific to shellfish, the report noted loss of traditional harvest sites, impacts to shellfish health, declining clam populations, and risk to knowledge sharing, food security, and identity. Next slide, please. The second document was a Climate Adaptation Action Plan, for, which was released in 2010 and contained uh, goals, strategies, and actions based on the findings from that technical report. Goals specific to shellfish included restore and enhance shellfish resources and habitat to maintain traditional livelihoods, reestablish natural diversity and harvestable clam populations, and maintain and enhance biotic productivity and species diversity along the coast. So these, the results from these reports have been really helpful in directing our work in fisheries, in addition to our primary tasks of addressing harvest management. Uh, next slide. Specifically, we have been focused on identifying and filling in knowledge gaps so we can strategically address the community's concerns and goals and ensure shellfish resources are available for future generations. This is a list of our main climate change projects. Uh, much of this work is just to better understand basic biology and population dynamics of different shellfish species so we can evaluate risks and vulnerabilities. And I just want to highlight two projects real quick. Uh, next slide. And uh, next slide. The first is a clam habitat vulnerability project which is led by Sarah Grossman. So according to the IPCC's RCP 8.5 scenario, the reservation is expected to see a plus two to plus five foot increase in sea level by 2100. So to help us better understand how this will impact clam habitat in the future, Sarah conducted an intertidal beach survey documenting the sediment composition of the beach at certain locations along the shore and inventoried the presence of tribally important clam species. She then overlaid a two foot and five foot elevation increase along the shore and observed whether current clam habitat would be able to migrate shoreward with the changes in sea level. 
The results are helping us identify which areas need to be preserved or restored to enable future community access and harvest for clams. Next slide. The second project is a fisheries vulnerability model. And the focus of this multi-year project was to examine how climate change might impact habitat conditions for tribally important fish and shellfish off the reservation where Swinomish tribal members traditionally harvest. To accomplish this, we partnered with the Skagit River System Cooperative and using historical data, a wave and sea level rise model and a temperature model were developed to predict how current habitat conditions might change under different IPCC scenarios using biological thresholds that are established in the scientific literature. This allows us to look at each species and see where they might be protected or vulnerable to climate change to scale the to the community. This also helps us identify areas where different adaptation actions like protection and restoration should be applied. Next slide. We are also currently implementing two adaptation actions. The first is promoting biological productivity and biodiversity by restoring a once dominant species to the reservation, which is the Olympia oyster. Next slide. Olympia oysters are ecosystem engineers that historically formed huge beds throughout the Pacific Northwest and provided habitat for other ecologically important species like prey for crab and salmon. Remnants of um, Olympia oysters have been found in shell middens, which indicates it, it was a traditional Swinomish food. Uh, but now due to over extraction, less than 5% of the historical beds remain. Our goal in restoring Olympia oysters to Swinomish tidelands is to bring back this ecologically and traditionally important species and increase resiliency in the near shore. We have joined a Pacific Coastwide effort and are working with tribal, state, academic, and nonprofit organizations to coordinate efforts, promote effective restoration actions, and share lessons learned. Next slide, please. The second adaptation action is our clam garden project. Clam gardening is an ancient indigenous practice that consists of a variety of habitat enhancement techniques and to increase clam production. There are relics of this management strategy all along the Northwest coast of America, and some in British Columbia have been dated to be 3,000 to 4,000 years old. While the construction and maintenance of a garden is unique to its location and the individuals caring for it, most gardens look like an intertidal terrace with a border of low-lying rocks. Recent ecological studies have found that within historical clam gardens, the abundance and size of natal, native little neck and butter clams, which are two native and tribally important species, are much greater than on unmodified beaches. Other fauna and flora also inhabit the beach and the rock wall, providing a local source for other edible species like sea urchins and cucumbers, and increase the presence of other habitat forming species like kelp. There's also potential for the garden to reduce wave energy and provide hospitable habitat as the oceans warm and acidify. We partnered with the Swinomish Community Environmental Health Program to build the first modern day clam garden in the US. And together we have developed a community-based approach that has been key to our success thus far. This is a biocultural restoration project that focuses not only on restoring the nearshore ecosystem and increasing clam production, but also on restoring the human and cultural relationships to the beach. Additionally, like any typical garden, this requires tending and maintenance to promote optimal growing conditions. Therefore, it has been essential to engage the community every step of the way. Next slide. Our goals for this project are to maximize ecological and cultural benefits to the tribe, assess the long-term effects of a garden on the near shore environment, and provide an example for other coastal communities that are interested in sustainably increasing clam production. The community has selected a location to build the garden and we have begun pre-construction data collection and are waiting on permits to start building the garden. Uh, we've got a long way to go, but we're really excited about the work that we've conducted this far and um, the growing support that we're receiving within the community. Next slide, please. In closing, I just wanted to note a couple of key lessons we've learned while conducting this work that might be helpful to others. Uh, it is a daunting and overwhelming task. Uh, using community priorities to guide projects helps narrow the scope of work and increases the likelihood for community support, which is key to the success of any project. Uh, it's also been helpful for us to start with what we know and build from there using resources that are already developed and available. No need to reinvent the wheel or become an expert in every discipline. 
And it's important to reach out to others, ask for help and build local and regional partnerships. Not only does this help spread limited resources, but connecting with others can have a booing effect that makes the work a little less terrifying. And I just have a slide of acknowledgements. Uh, I just wanna thank the Tribal Senate and Fish and Game Commission for all of their support and direction in our work, all of our funders and partners. And the link at the bottom, which is cut off, is um, if you go to uh, Swinomish, uh, website, you can go to resources and publications, and we have a lot of reports on that go into detail on all of our different projects. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, one more presenter from the lower 48. Is that correct, Lauren? That's correct. Yep. Okay. And then after um, this presentation, we'll stop for questions and comments. Thank you. Zoe, if you're ready, we're ready for you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe, and I work as the environmental specialist for the Upper Snake River Tribes Foundation. And uh, today, I'm just going to kind of briefly go over our climate change projects. So you can go to the next slide. So USERT was formed in 1998 by our USERT member tribes. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit as of 2007. Our office is located in Boise, Idaho, and our four member tribes are located in region nine and 10. Um, and that also crosses like state borders and regional borders. So that um, always uh, presents a unique challenge. So next slide. Our four member tribes that I'll be referencing today are the Shoshone Paiute tribe, the Shoshone Bannock tribe, the Fort McDermott Paiute and Shoshone tribe, as well as the Burns Paiute tribe. Next slide. So the three uh, climate change projects I'll go over today are our climate change vulnerability assessment, our climate change adaptation and strategy program, and our climate-based community outreach and education program. Next slide. And before I get into those details, I just want to talk briefly about why climate-based projects are important to USERT. So first of all, we, we look into cultural impacts on tradition, spirituality, cultural identity. Uh, we also look at water impacts on aquatic habitats, precipitation and stream flow changes. Uh, we look at water temperature changes. We also go into sagebrush step impacts on native plants, um, the proliferation of invasive weeds, and as we've experienced more recently, increased wildfire frequency. And we also uh, even look at economic impacts and the effects on tribal enterprises. And I just want to show this uh, brief video that we have um, produced, and it just gives a really good perspective from our four member tribes on why climate change programs are important to them. So you're good. Yeah, can no one else hear this? No, we can't hear it. Okay. It, it looks like a lovely video. I, I do worry this might take up so much bandwidth though that it might be difficult for people to... Okay, no problem. We, but we can send it out as a part of the, the slides for people. Yeah, great. So basically the, um, the video that I was gonna show just gives kind of an overview of our four member tribes perspective on climate change, how they feel that it's important for their culture, um, for their environment, and um, just kind of their, their uh, take on it. So you can just go to the next slide. Um, and so whenever I'm referencing our projects, our project area that I am talking about is over um, 62,000 acres worth of project land that we're, we're referencing and our four member tribes are spread out quite a bit. So just whenever I reference a project area, I'm talking about, about a pretty large landscape. So you can go to the next slide. 
So I'll start with our vulnerability assessment and adaptation strategy process. So we started with the vulnerability assessment, which analyzes um, downscale temperature and precipitation projections for the project area. Um, we did site visits to USERP member tribes reservations to identify those shared concerns about climate change. Um, we also used the NatureServe CCVI and other methods to determine relative vulnerability rankings um, for our tribes. And then it was also, um, we conducted a collaborative vulnerability assessment workshop in Boise um, with our four member tribes staff and leadership. And then as a continuation of the vulnerability assessment, we had an adaptation strategy process uh, project. So that was a collaborative effort between USER and the four member tribes, the leadership, the staff, and their members. Uh, we conducted reservation workshops. Um, it's working on the creation of an adaptation strategy workbook and literature library that would be available to all the USER members as well as our foundation. Um, and the production of climate resilience videos, which I tried to show earlier. And we also have a couple others on our website that go into a little bit more depth on the climate change perspective. And so I would definitely recommend if you wanna watch those, those are on our website. And then lastly, the adaptation implementation pilot project. And so you can go to the next one. Uh, so the next project, um, which I think is one that people are really excited about and interested to learn about, is our climate-based community outreach and education program. So this includes videos, resilience projects, and youth climate lessons that focus on how a changing climate um, is affecting tribal cultural resources and what those students can do to sustain those resources or adapt should those resources become non-sustainable under new climate scenarios. So these pictures are just uh, kind of a good representation of when the project was first implemented, getting kids and uh, the youth in the tribes um, basically excited to learn about climate change. So trying to do a lot of hands-on projects and things to get the youth excited. So you can go on. And so our implementation strategies for this program was a resilience action service learning project. We also did um, a climate resilience after school program and whole curriculum that was um, given to the tribes. And then uh, it also included in-home um, family resilience projects, which is essentially where the youth got to bring home things that they learned and share it with their parents and their elders. And so it wasn't just the youth getting to participate in this project, but also um, eventually becoming a, a community program and uh, ending with an intertribal youth tour. So you can go to the next one. And uh, I just wanted to throw in here um, kind of the resources that we have for funding for projects like this that are kind of large scope, especially with four different tribes. Um, we use the EPA, the BPA, the IA, the USDA and the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. So those are all really great resources for funding or implementation strategies um, that I would recommend looking into. And the next slide. I just wanted to uh, briefly mention gap funding and how useful it has been uh, for USERT. And so just kind of a recommendation for any other organizations out there. Um, GAP promotes tribal government efforts to develop core environmental program capacities. So it's a great uh, resource because it's specifically designed for tribal environmental programs. So it's literally designed to, to be used by tribes. And um, it's, it's got a wide variety of uses, admin, financial, management, informational, legal, communication. And you can also do media specific program support like ambient air quality, water quality, waste management, et cetera. Um, so if anyone is new to, to gap funding, the EPA for your region usually has webinars on it as well. I just attended one this morning. So um, very, very helpful. You can go on. And uh, the difficulties that we face in these projects um, definitely are capacity. Our four member tribes are small and mostly rural. So capacity is kind of something that we're always facing. Um, establishing and maintaining engagement within the community, youth and tribal leaders is definitely a challenge. And then bring on the COVID-19 pandemic where we can't go to the reservations, we can't do face-to-face -face interactions. Um, so definitely uh, maintaining the engagement with our projects during the pandemic has, has been a challenge. Um, limited funding can always be a challenge for any organization um, that leads us to focus on keystone species and habitats and minimize our project goals so that we can um, remain realistic within our funding. And again, like I mentioned, the project uh, area size over 62,000 
Um, acres is just a lot of landscape for us to cover. So that's, that's always a challenge. So definitely just knowing your challenges that you'll face in the current projects and future projects is, is a good lesson to, to learn. And then the next slide. Just a brief summary that climate change programs that seek to understand the full impact on cultural and environmental source resources for tribal communities is vital and that's why we're doing it. And each of these programs were a collaborative effort between USERT, the four member tribes and various agencies that assisted with funding and implementation. So anyone who is doing a project like this, it's not just one person or one tribe or one organization, it's a very big group effort. And if anyone who's watching is interested in additional information, those uh, resilience videos are really great and more data on our programs, I would definitely suggest um, visiting our website and my contact information is on there as well as everyone else who works at USERP if anyone has questions. And that's it for me. Thanks, Zoe. If there are any questions or comments that anybody wants to make, now would be a good time. And if not, then we can keep going. Okay, I did get a question in from one of our um, EPA project officers, Santina Gary, and uh, she mentioned, she wondered if uh, any of the panelists or even the audience had any suggestions on best practices for successfully attaining grants uh, to do this kind of cl climate work. Um, grants beyond GAP. And Courtney, I also wanted to ask you, uh, I, I hope I didn't miss it, but I don't think that you talked about who was funding um, this excellent work that you're doing for the uh, Swinomish tribe. Oh, sorry, at the bottom of each slide on the projects, I had a list of the different funders, oh. um, but I think that was cut off. Um, so they're mostly funded by um, the tribe, EPA, um, NOAA, we have an SK grant, as well as a Northwest uh, CASC uh, grant, um, lots of BIA grants. Uh -huh. um, yeah, wide variety. And for us, it's just been helpful working as a team to, to find and um, apply for different grants. Um, and once you do one, it's pretty easy to kind of use a lot of that same work, a lot of the same writing to apply for other grants. Um, so you know, it doesn't, you don't have to start from scratch each time. Um, yeah, it is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to acquire, uh, how many grants were they in total? For all of our projects? Uh, for this climate project that you were discussing. Um, for, well, for the Clam Garden project, there was um, EPA, the Puget Sound Tribal Capacity Grant, um, and a, two different Washington Sea Grant grants. And then those funding sources have Closed. So now we're, we have a NOAA SK grant and a, a Northwest CASC grant. Um, and that's just for the clam garden work. And so we have for like the Olympia oyster work, there was EPA grants, BIA grants, um, and a CREO uh, grant. Uh, yeah, just wide variety. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. <laughs> Congratulations to you for getting that funding. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Uh, and Zoe, I wanted to ask you, um, you had mentioned, I was really interested in the vulnerability assessment. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about the work that you did for that assessment. How did that, how did that benefit your projects? How did it, why was that, it, like that's where you started, why was that where you started and, and how did it help? Um, well, I'll, I'll kind of take off of what Ms. Salazar started, um, what she said at the very beginning when she mentioned uh, vulnerability assessments, you kind of need to know where you are in order to know where you need to go. Um, if that's like the simplest answer, just that 
um, basically understanding how vulnerable each of our four tribes were. And like I said before, they're in different regions and some of them in different states. So they're each affected just a little bit differently from each other. So really understanding like the full vulnerability of each tribe and kind of the unique position that they're in um, helped us figure out in the adaptation strategies and then all the programs that we did after that for the education, um, very unique and specific um, topics that we needed to focus on. Um, so basically it is just kind of where you have to start in order to, to get where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And did you make up your own assessment or did you go to some other resources to help you develop it? I believe we did go to other resources. I'm a newer member of you, sir, but I know that Alexis is on here and she may be able to give me some backup on that. Um, let me see. Sure, I'd be happy to. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, we actually use a subcontractor called Adaptation International who has um, a wide variety of resources under their belt and connections that have to do with research and climate change projects. They've actually worked with a lot of tribes throughout the Pacific Northwest. So we were very lucky to make that connection. And through them, we, we worked with uh, Washington State University and, and Oregon State. And through all of that, we were able to come together as a big collaborative group and compile all this information on keystone species and habitats that allowed us to use it as a catalyst to apply for funding for other projects. So as Zoe was saying, it made a really good baseline for us to use as a result so we could apply for additional funding and build other projects on top. It's basically a, a stepping stone for every other project we've had. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, so um, if anybody would like to speak and you're, um, uh, you're welcome to raise your hand. I believe you have the ability to do that in this. Well, uh, maybe not. <laughs> I, I know that in previous um, webinars, I've been able to use that function, um, but I don't see it here. Um, why don't we move on then to our next set of speakers from Alaska. Okay, Jennifer, you're first up. Okay. I, um, so I work for ECOC Village Council. I'm the environmental coordinator and you can go to the next screen. So ECOC or ECOC is uh, the, it's the meaning of the last village down. It's located there in Bristol Bay. Um, and it is 17 miles from the region or the closest regional hub, which is Dillingham. It's um, a native village that's been there for, for time immemorial. And uh, year round occupancy ended in the 1960s when the school shut down and residents had to move kids to Dillingham for school. We'll go to the next slide. So the, uh, these, are, these are my nieces and nephew picking um, their, their commercial set net, um, gill net, um, net and uh, it's sockeye, they're fishing. And, um, and then the other picture is uh, them picking salmon berries. And it's, a it's still a traditional seasonal village. It goes from one winter watchman to 450 people subsisting in commercial fishing and processing in the summer. Next slide. So, um, erosion, I know I put uh, flooding and erosion in the title of this uh, slideshow, but um, really our largest concern is erosion right now. ECOC has al always dealt with um, flooding and erosion has probably always been there as well, but now it's encroaching on people and the way they use the beach. Um, so uh, that's going to be the focus of the rest of the 
slides and I might talk about flooding in a moment. Um, so Ecock Village um, erosion assessment was prepared by Golder Associates in 2007 and reported that the bluff had eroded 125 feet between 1912 and 1981, and that's at a rate of two feet per year, and then an additional 65 feet from 1981 to 2006 at a rate of 2.6 per year. Um, and since then, we've been working with, um, starting back in 2017, we've been working with UAF and DGGS um, to compile more measurements and erosion monitoring and rates have increased up to um, 4.3 feet per year. So next slide. Um, I'm not gonna show the video just because it's uh, probably gonna cause the same problems, but I am putting the link in the chat in case you get a chance to click on it, watch it. Um, our beach is our natural infrastructure. So as you saw in, in one of the previous slides, um, the people picking fish from their nets, um, the beach fishermen actually put their, their net out into the water. And then with the pulley system, they pull it in with a truck. And you can see all that in this YouTube video. Um, and you can see how far uh, fishermen drive down the beach to their set net site and then back with their entire catch to the fish processor that's spe specially set up for pickup trucks to unload their catch into the processor. Um, and so as erosion has happened, uh, what happens is we, we lose the top layer of gravel and it becomes really mushy and so it, it gets tricky for people to get back with their catch to the processor without getting stuck. Um, we also have other problems about the, the beach narrowing to the point where some of our fishermen actually can only use one tide per day or fish one tide per day um, because they can't bring their fish back on the, on the larger tide. And so next slide. Oh, we went too far. Okay, there you go. Um, so what we've been doing to prevent and plan for the future. So monitoring um, erosion prior to 2006. And then when, and then when ECOC received um, the IGAP award, they, the, the environmental coordinator started right away on um, prioritizing with the council um, in the work plans that monitoring should be a priority and finding solutions to erosion. Um, back then in 2006, from what I was told when I came on in 2011 um, by the previous IGAP coordinator was the only solutions that he had learned about at trainings was to write letters to the Army Corps of Engineers for help. And um, there wasn't ever a response to those letters. So um, we presented about our, we've presented about our erosion since 2011 in ECOC to um, multiple conferences. Next slide. So then in 2016, I started getting reports from people in ECOC that there were other people who were digging up, you know, they were trying to solve their own flooding and erosion issues along the beach by digging up beach gravel and uh, stockpiling it. And you can see that in the picture there where there's a huge hole on the, on the ocean side of the beach and a giant pile on right up against that property there. Um, people were also using all kinds of uh, container vans and they'd fill those up with gravel. And um, so when storms came around, they would 
um, get lifted up and moved around the beach. We started reporting the problems to DNR and Army Corps of Engineers. Army Corps of Engineers did visit Ecock Beach for this problem and um, they've written letters, but as far as uh, actually doing any kind of fining or any kind of other repercussions for the people that are digging beach gravel, there hasn't been a solution. Um, we did ask village and regional corporations to visit ECOC and evaluate and present flyers pointing out other issues with beach gravel mining. And um, so some people listened to that. It didn't fix everything. So next slide, please. Um, so in the near future, um, so back to 2017, BBNA put on a, a um, with UAF and um, DGGS put on a stake for stakeholders uh, training where we were given instructions on how to measure our beach profile every time we visited ECOC. We also had um, these really nice cameras put in where we could monitor the beach um, and watch erosion, you know, as a time-lapse situation. Um, and uh, then we did FEMA plans through uh, BBNA got the, the awarded the grant and then BBNA worked with us with engineers to come up with our FEMA hazard mitigation plans. In 2021, or this past summer, actually, um, we were able to go down. I was able to go down to ECOC with our partners at UAF and gather more shoreline change with uh, a nice GPS. We walked the entire beach with um, a GPS. And so what they're doing is making model maps for us to see what the future will look like. and. Um, so we know what's gonna happen. And then we just recently ex, um, got accepted for the Tribal Climate Resilience Funding from BIA to perform a feasibility study on erosion to protect ECOC. And um, so we're hoping that we come up with some solutions and, and the it's able to be presented to the council. By now, my tribal membership is is tired of talking to me about erosion, but um, they've cooperated, you know, through all these years because there needs to be something done. We've got buildings falling off the bluff and um, people people losing out on fishing because we can't get down down the beach. So. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, there is a question. How much did it cost to contract the engineers? So the, the uh, tribal resilience grant that we're gonna get is uh, about $80,000. And so what they're gonna do is hold four meetings. They're gonna travel to ECOC and they're gonna um, talk to everybody who's been experiencing the erosion and, um, and then just come up with some ideas after seeing ECOC and talking to people. We've already got all the, we've got so much data from the stake, from stakeholders about where, where the beach erodes and where it accretes. And so we've done a lot of work for them so all that information will go towards that um yeah and we uh i didn't mention that i did work with anthc to um submit that grant so they came up they they were able to help me write that grant for the bia resilience grant fantastic you've been very successful in getting this funding um, I wondered if you have worked with other tribes that have had 
experiencing other similar issues? Usually, um, no, I haven't worked with any other tribes um, experiencing these issues. What I do is I, I make sure that I, if I am given an opportunity to present on our issues at ECOC, I do. I, it's actually kind of difficult sometimes because I'll go to conferences and hear of, you know, issues around erosion that seem way um, bigger, like bigger problems than ECOX. And it, um, it kind of, it feels discouraging, but as long as I keep, I think as long as we keep talking about it, because it is an issue for us and we can't, I can't compare our problems to other people's problems. It's, it, it doesn't help my tribal members move forward and um, safety and, you know, carrying on traditions for generations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that was very, very interesting. Lauren, shall we move to the next presenter? Thank you, Jennifer. Hal, you're up next. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Lauren. Everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, my name is Hal Shepard, and I am a consultant and uh, that works with the Norton Bay Intertribal Watershed Council. Uh, located up in the Bering Sea area, as well as uh, a number of tribes uh, in that same area on climate change matters. And I want to say right off the bat that uh, these, uh, the opinions that I'm expressing are, are mine uh, during this presentation, not necessarily those of the uh, Norton Bay Watershed Council. And I'm going to talk about the Norton Bay Intertribal, uh, the Watershed Council's climate adaptation training process over the past 10 years or so. This first slide is sort of ties into, I, I think the question was asked of Jennifer during the, nat the last presentation about other tribes experiencing similar problems. And indeed there are, especially in the Arctic region of Alaska, uh, where climate change is, uh, temperatures are warming about three times the rate they are anywhere else in the world. This photo on my first slide is, that, uh, is a picture of the native village of Gullivan. That area all in blue is uh, a flood event from a storm surge that occurred back, I think it was in about 2011. Um, next slide, please. So the Norton Bay, sorry this for the size of the print in this slide, Norton Bay is located on the southern part of Norton Sound, which is basically is in the Bering, North Bering Sea region. The tribes uh, represented and tribal members and tribal council members represented it on the watershed council are from the native village of Gullivan that you can see uh, native village of Elam, Unalakleet, Shaktulik, and Shishmaraf. Those are the five tribes that are, that are represented. Also, uh, actually, outside of Norton Bay, we're starting to gain some membership from other tribes. There's a uh, native village of uh, Brevik Mission is on that. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the uh, planning process for the Watershed Council started probably back in 2013 with the Norton Bay Climate Change Action Plan. And this was sort of a generalized plan in which we worked together, the Watershed Council, myself, and the uh, Model Forest Policy Project. We used their planning climate adaption planning process. They're located actually in the lower 48 area, Idaho area. And they, they assist small nonprofit profits in developing uh, climate action plans. Again, this was sort of a regional action plan that was kind of a shotgun approach to identifying issues, the infrastructure. There's two main issues that the plan uh, identified were infrastructure problems and issues, which are things like coastal erosion, storm surges that are threatening homes and buildings and structures and basically human welfare, things like that. And then there's the subsistence resources, which is 
uh, sort of the freshwater, I think somebody from EPA discussed those uh, issues uh, about watersheds uh, that impact stream flows, and impact stream temperatures, and therefore critical habitat for salmon and other fish and wildlife. So the Norton Bay Climate Change Action Plan was completed in about 2014. Uh, next slide, please. And after we completed that plan, we moved into the Norton Sound Tribal Village Climate Change Adaption Training. And that was again put on, uh, sponsored by the Norton, the Norton Bay Watershed Council. We held several, this is before COVID, in those glory days, uh, about uh, 2014, 2015, we held meetings in person uh, up in the Nome area, which is sort of the central uh, main city in the Bering Sea region to uh, get the word out, educate um, tribal, mostly tribal villages about climate change and what kinds of things they can do to address uh, the issue, including climate change, climate adaption planning, seeking funding, what kind of issues are going on. This is another, uh, this slide uh, is from, or the photo on this slide is from the native village of Teller. This is the spit, which is about a two mile long spit uh, in between Grantley Harbor and uh, Port Clearance on the left side. That is a very thin spit. Uh, this is a, uh, an optic cable that was installed in 2011 and was almost three months after it was installed was destroyed by a storm surge and still sits there today uh, on the spit. Um, and uh, so next slide, please. And after we did the, uh, the finish the training, again, it was about a year long training in which we invited tribal members to come to the Nome areas uh, to um, have several meetings and, and conducted the training. We've sort of went into, this is sort of the infrastructure side that I call it from, uh, that the Watershed Council works on, the hazard mitigation planning. And we, Got a grant, uh, most of our grants, by the way, um, I, I'm very, uh, I have been very lame and not uh, putting the uh, acknowledgements to our grantors on one of my slides, but most of our grants are from BIA TRP projects, Tribal Resiliency Program. I saw those listed in the chat, uh, as well as US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Tribal Fish and Wildlife Grants, and also BIA, uh, uh, there's a freshwater water resources pre-development and planning grants are where the Watershed Council and the tribes that I work with uh, have gotten most of their funding from. This one is a BIA grant, TRP project, uh, hazard mitigation plans. We basically drafted a climate risk assessment that the native village of Teller could adapt and add to their existing hazard mitigation plan. So they now have a hazard mitigation plan that is supposed to be renewed every five years that they have uh, attached this climate risk assessment update to it. So it essentially turns their HMP into a climate uh, adaption plan. Next slide, please. Then we went on to uh, a, a project that was a plan, uh, the Norton Bay Watershed Ocean and Coastal Management Plan that the Watershed Council actually just officially approved last Thursday. So we're in the process of trying to uh, get that plan uh, posted and uh, uh, finalized so we can send it out to the media and start um, posting it around. This was a uh, in fact, a effort in which we use the, uh, this is a long, uh, long title, the Marine Protection Area Rapid Vulnerability Assessment sort of matrix to develop uh, a rapid vul vulnerability assessment of subsistence resources, impacts to those resources from climate change in the Norton Bay watershed. And from that, when we got the MPARVAT, very long acronym, 
completed, we turned that into the Norton Bay Watershed Ocean Coastal Management Plan. And that is a plan that addresses, focuses again, and this is on the subsistence side, on the impacts to climate change on the marine and freshwater habitats, and then uh, develops some strategies about where to go from here. What do we do about those, uh, about those impacts? So this is a really large effort. And one, one of the things that, you know, looking for assistance maybe from EPA and other tribes working on these issues from is how do you, once you have this huge plan that you develop, how do you get people to read it? How do you get, how do you get the word out? So that's really what our main uh, aspect is. And part of the reasons that we agreed to participate in this, um, in this webinar was to start getting the word out about these plans. Yeah. Next slide. Okay, and so one of the things that came out uh, again of the Norton Bay Watershed uh, Management Plan, the climate plan, was a risk assessment. And this is currently a, a risk assessment that the, the native village of Elam, which again is a member of the Watershed Council, and the Watershed Council are working on to address um, fish die-offs primarily is the, is the issue one of the main concerns in the Arctic region uh, two years ago, uh, many of you have probably heard about in 2019, we had massive fish die-offs and these were not, not regular spawning die-offs. These were fish that had been um, suffocated essentially because the water temperature in 2019 had reached absolutely record levels in many of these rivers in some places and the smaller temperature is upwards of 80 and 90 degrees. And of course, once that happens, then the dissolved oxygen content in the water starts to go down and the fish suffocate. So, so these fish were prematurely dying off uh, before pre-spawning. And so we have the native village of Elam again and the Watershed Council have been started to develop a risk assessment that focuses on sort of the, the beginning. Um, you, you look at snowpack, you look at precipitation, and you try to develop these models, or you incorporate these models into the plan that will ultimately show how, how high in a particular river or stream uh, are your water level, levels going to be for that summer. And then you, uh, you insert climate forecasting to try to find out what the temperatures are gonna be that summer. And then you try to um, figure out, and ultimately the, the idea is, is to predict how much and how bad the die off is gonna be that year, because we know it's gonna come back again. It hasn't been at, back as bad yet, but um, and except for maybe I should say in some places in the Yukon last summer, in fact, there were very poor fish returns, um, partial, uh, partially from climate change. Next slide, please. Hal, sorry to interrupt you. You have one more minute. Okay, so I'm going to pass this slide up because that's basically what I just said. Um, one of the big things uh, that and, and concerns is that I was at a, a, a conference, ATCEM, uh, it's called, last a uh, couple weeks ago, in that we had several representatives from the state, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, talking about the horrible returns that happened last year. And they were asked the question is, well, what are you going to do about it? And they said, well, you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do about climate change. Our answer to this problem is, is that salmon happen to be extremely uh, resilient and adaptable, and we hope that we'll do that. So that's kind of the opposite of what I think the tribes want to do. Uh, this recent in, in Alaska, for example, to take all this data and information um, and go to the federal agencies, go to the state agencies and say, here, this map uh, shows, for example, in this slide, where we have mining activity that might be taking place in, in these stream reaches. And um, we, we need to mitigate for those. These, these are critical stream reaches that these villages rely on for subsistence. And you need to mitigate the impacts of, uh, of climate change by maybe regulating development uh, on these streams and rivers. Next slide, please. 
I think, and, and this again is, again, the next step. Uh, I'll just run through these, return of local control. There's a big concern in, in the Arctic Village communities that local control has been taken away. Um, and there's not that much uh, along those same lines, traditional knowledge co-management, um, working with the federal and state agencies on a government-to-government uh, -government basis uh, on these issues. And uh, I will stop there because I'm probably out of time. I'm so sorry because it, it was all extremely interesting. And I think this is the, a really important point. Thank you so very much for your presentation. Um, shall we move on to our final presenter today? Presenters. Yep, Stephen, are you ready? Uh, yep. Yeah. Stephen Payton, I'm the Regional IGAP Environmental Coordinator for Chugach Regional Resources. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about some ongoing research we're doing with tribes in, in the Chugach region on climate change adaptation and preparedness. Um, sorry. So CERT is an intertribal natural resource management and economic profit. And it was formed in 1984 to serve the tribes of the Chugach region. And CERC works to promote tribal sovereignty and the protection of our subsistence lifestyle and to assure the, con the conservation, sustainable economic development and stewardship of the natural resources in the traditional use areas of the Chugach region. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so in 2014, 2015, we have, um, so we have a three phase climate change program. Um, so then we completed an analysis of the federal and state programs for climate change mitigation. And right now we're working on Phase two, where you develop a vulner vulnerability assessment of cultural resources. So we picked it up again in 2019 with a vulnerability assessment, specifically looking at climate impacts on subsistence resources. I'll show you some of the preliminary results from that assessment, but I want to stress that they're preliminary as deeper analysis and fact checking is still ongoing. We plan to complete the the assessments later this year and move on to phase three, where we'll be engaging tribes to develop a regional, oh, I missed something. And if tribes desire tribal monitoring and adaptation plans to support continued access to subsistence resources. Uh, next slide. So our goal with this project is to understand what changes residents are already seeing in the environment that impact their livelihoods, assess the risk of further changes to important resources, and in the adaptation, adaptation planning stage of this project, identify methods to mitigate or adjust to those impacts if possible. In the midst of our community meetings that we're able to hold, we also received a very strong mandate from the tribal citizens we serve to make sure that the health and well being were at the center of this project. So, this is a chart from the 2016 report The Impacts of Climate Change on Human Health in the United States, a scientific assessment. This shows how climate change can drive different health outcomes. In short, climate change has the potential to create environmental hazards to which people can be exposed through existing or changing exposure pathways. Exposure pathways can cause impacts to human health, which can result in dis disparate health outcomes depending on the ability to adapt to those impacts. Next slide. So how does that fit into vulnerability is described in dry terms as a combination of exposure to a risk combined to a risk balanced by the adaptive capacity that an individual or community has. Subsistence creates an exposure pathway for environmental hazards to human health in a myriad of ways. For example, larger and more frequent harmful algal blooms increase the risk of contracting paralytic shellfish poisoning from clams, 
a less direct exposure pathway to climate drivers is that changes to the timing, abundance, or distribution of subsistence resources can lead to food insecurity or dependence on store-bought foods and the associated negative health impacts of a Western diet able to obtain the wild food they need. However, eliminating that exposure pathway by not participating in the indigenous culture or harvest isn't an option in our communities. Subsistence lifestyles are just that. They're a way of building adaptive capacity in our communities. As people in our region say, when the tide is out, the table will set. Subsistence and fishing can have positive impacts on health outcomes by providing exercise, reducing the prevalence of diseases linked to obesity, and creating community and cultural touchstones that promote mental health and well being. Our challenge is to hold up subsistence as a valuable part of healthy traditional lifestyle, the exposure and sensitivity of resources and people alike to the harmful impacts of climate change. Uh, next slide. How community, community meetings were held. These are some of the questions that were asked during these meetings and there were surveys conducted. Um, I won't bother reading to those to you guys. Uh, next slide. So from the questions and the surveys that we um, asked, these are some of the results that we got. So on the bottom, you can see the perceived risk to a resource, and that's how people rated it. And then on the left, the impact on livelihood. So yeah, let's see. So I think that's all I got for that slide. Missed. Okay, so in 2017, the US Forest Service, they conducted a climate vulnerability assessment in the region, and that identified everything that you see on the right, the predicted changes from that. This was the predictive changes that were in that literature. And then on the left are the observations that people have seen, and you can see the similarities. Hotter, drier summers, you know, that goes with the uh, three degrees of warming over the next 50 years. We've definitely seen that in the region. Warmer winters and less snow until uh, this year, that is. Larger algal blooms in rivers, creeks, and bays. All of these things have been changing. Next slide. So a lot of this is basically a graphic showing of what's in that last slide. And you can see in the Chugach region there in the Kenai Peninsula, there's a lot of um, that coastal rainforest. And it, as time goes on, it's really supposed to turn into a lot of it uh, kind of prairie and grasslands and just a completely different biome than what we have right now. So this is what people are going to have to learn to adapt to. Stephen, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We Next are, uh, can you hear me, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, okay. We are at our uh, uh, the close of our hour or two hours today. Um, I am perfectly happy to stay on and I'm sure others would be as well. But I did want to let you know we are at the close. Um, and I wanted to just pause to see if there were, I don't see any questions on the chat, um, but I wanted to say you're welcome to continue going on, uh, but if there are those who need to go at this time, of course, I understand, um, and we will be sending the slides and the recording out once we have those ready. Okay. Okay. So let's keep um, going. I don't really... 
I don't mind skipping to like the last two slides or three. I'll go ahead one and is, skip. Um, just next let steps. me know when it doesn't stop. Okay. I think there's a bit of a delay on my end, so. Uh, keep next going. Steps, is that where you're wanting to be? Oh, uh, there. Yeah. Perfect. So from everything that we've been collecting, these are some of the things that some existing programs we have and some programs that we might have in the future to help um, adapt to this change. The CERC has been collecting water samples for ocean acidification monitoring since December of 2015. And that long-term data is going to be essential in understanding OA's impacts on the coastal communities in the region and find a program for harmful algal bloom and shellfish toxin monitor. Um, blooms of algae which create deadly toxins will continue to become more frequent and we've been seeing them become more frequent. The sampling effort is going to give the coastal communities kind of an early warning system if there is potential for shellfish harvested to be toxic. And then there's a list of um, potential future programs, which include monitoring important subsistence fish and wildlife populations, areas in the region which have potential landslides that could result in a tsunami that would impact communities, and other areas of concern may arise with continued um, community engagement. And next slide. And um, this just shows some more actions that are being taken to adapt to these climate change issues right now. So the enhancement programs that CERC has through the Pride Marine Institute are pretty great. The um, clam outplanting, we take juvenile clams and put them back on a traditional in traditional harvest areas in the hopes that they'll grow and then they'll be able to be harvested in the future. And we've also um, planted adult clams in the hopes that they'll spawn and keep that, you know, that area harvestable. Um, kelp farming and the impacts that kelp is supposed to have on ocean acidification. That's a big one that we're working on right now. Um, community food security facilities. So the, one thing that we're working on is trying to get a facility that would have, say, um, freezers and equipment for people to harvest or to um, process their harvest if they don't have the, you know, those resources um, already. Oh, sorry. And then we're always going to keep working with the communities looking for areas, you know, of concern. And that is my last slide. What a wonderful slide. Thanks for everybody that stayed on there. That is great. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> uh, you still have quite a few people on and um, uh, Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Lauren pasted in resources and links in the chat box. I wanted to add those. I also want to thank uh, you, Stephen, for your presentation. Um, I know that you got Regional Resource Commission has done an awful lot of work, especially on HABs, um, harmful algal, algal blooms, which um, uh, we recently posted a video that was produced by um, CRRC on ocean acidification that is on our website. Um, so um, thank you for your work and your presentation. Um, I should say that EPA is also going to be coming out with some resources on HABs for uh, EPA Region 10. Uh, soon, I hope, we'll be producing those. Um, I thank you very much to everybody for attending and for staying on a little longer. Much appreciated. I do want to let you know um, that we will be having another webinar, or the um, Alaska Forum will have it, having another webinar tomorrow on um, IGAP. And um, I can turn it over to 
Amy to talk about that. But before I do, I do want to say thank you to Lauren and uh, to um, Catherine for putting together the, the webinar and finding all of these wonderful presenters. And thank you to the presenters for spending your time, so much of your time with us today. Thanks, Susan, for facilitating. And thank you to everyone who presented. We really appreciate it.